I want to thank um, Darius, Professor Darius Heim and Professor uh, Pablo Dalí Compagni for their kind invitation to be here with you today. It is a great pleasure for me. Uh, I am Silvana Flores Larsen. I work in the laboratory of bioclimatic buildings. I am a senior researcher in uh, CONICET, which is an institution, a public institution uh, for uh, research in Argentina. Uh, and my institution belongs to the National University of Salta. Okay. So, uh, first of all, because we are in different hemispheres and it is very different there and here, I want to present you where I am at this moment. Um, I live in Salta. Salta is a province in the north part of Argentina. Um, this uh, province limits with Chile, with Bolivia in the north and with Paraguay. Okay, it is important to show you the location because uh, our institute works on problems that the people has in this region of the country. So uh, we try to to research solutions for these people in this particular region of Argentina. Okay, so uh, Salta City is um, a province with a capital. He, uh, its name is uh, Salta City, and the province has a topographic profile which is very different from the east to the west. Okay, in the west, in the east, we have um, low altitudes and hot climates, and as you move to the west, you uh, start to increase the height. For example, Salta City is at uh, something about uh, 1,200 meters over the sea level. And as you move to the west, you will find the Andes Mountains. And uh, in the Andes Mountains, you have a special place which we call the Puna. The Puna is a, a place uh, which is a, very uh, uh, high, uh, something about more than 3,000 meters over the sea level. So it has special conditions, special weather conditions and solar radiation here. And uh, it is very interesting for solar applications, okay? In th this Puna um, uh, region uh, covers the north part, northwest part of Argentina, also Chile and Bolivia, okay? In this part, you can find uh, the, uh, the salar of Arizaro. Maybe you hear about, about it. It's, it is the most dry site on the earth. OK. Uh, and I will show you some pictures of, of this special place, which we call Puna. But uh, before that, I want to present you my city. Um, these are some pictures of, of Salta City, which is in Baylis, in a, in, in a zone of Baylis in Argentina. Um, it is a Spanish city mm, of the colonial times. So the architecture uh, is uh, Spanish-like, mainly from the south of Spain, Sevilla, Granada, etc. Uh, and here we have a university, a national university of Salta, which has uh, different faculties. I work on the Faculty of Exact Sciences, where, uh, where we have a physics department. We have degrees in physics and renewable energies and post-degree studies on uh, such as the master or PhD in sciences. I made my PhD in this university. And uh, in the university, we also have this institution in ENCO, which means non-conventional energy research institute uh, that covers different topics on renewable energies mainly in solar energy like this here and also in water health energy planning and education and communication electronics and etc i work particularly in uh, bioclimatic buildings and energy efficiency 
as Professor Darius told you some minutes ago, okay? So, my lecture today is divided in two parts. The first part uh, covers the uh, some bioclimatic buildings uh, in the zone of Puna in Argentina, and the second part uh, deals with climate change of some uh, places in Argentina. Well, when I uh, talk about Puna, I am referring to this special region uh, in the northwest part of Argentina, marked here with a green uh, uh, in green. And uh, I mean, my institution have worked a lot in different buildings in this zone, which are marked here in yellow. Today, I am only talk about two of them that I consider are the most important ones um, that are placed in, in these places uh, at something like 3,000 meters over the sea level. Okay, here you can see in this Google Earth picture, you can see um, how it changes the orography or the topography of the, of the province from this part, which is very hot. This is one of the hottest uh, places in all Argentina. Here you can have maybe 47 or 48 degrees in summer, okay? And as you move to the west, you you find the Andes, okay? Salta City is in the in a transition region between these two. So this is a zone of Baileys, and this is the zone, the, the, brown, the brown is the zone of Puna, okay? Here you have a lot of volcanoes and salars. So when I talk about Puna, I am speaking about landscapes like, like this, like this one here in the, you can see the Andes, and uh, this is the Salar of Arizaro, okay? It is a place that it uh, looks like Mars in uh, big parts of the, of the landscape. Um, and uh, because it is so high, uh, there is interest in a uh, mounting um, astronomic, for example, ast astronomic observatories here in the, in the mountains. And we have uh, a few ones here. Uh, uh, it is a very lonely place, very isolated from the net energy, from gas, and it has uh, very few roads which are not paved. So it is not well connected to the rest of the country. It is a very lonely part of the country and with very very extreme weather the the sea you can the the sea here uh, sorry the the sky here uh, you can uh, see that it is very blue it has a deep blue color almost all the part of the year because here you have a lot of solar radiation okay this is the typical sky in this zone the zone ha uh, has also interest for, for biologists. Here you can see a picture of a, a sea eye um, in the salar. Here uh, you can find living stromatolites, stromatolites, which are microorganisms that lived in the earth 3,500 years ago when the life was starting in the earth. And they are the responsibles the responsibility to make the oxygen of our atmosphere, okay? It was uh, thought that the, uh, these microorganisms were dead uh, a billion years ago, but in this place, they found some years ago living stromatolites. So it is a very interesting place for biologists. And also, of course, for the geologists, because you have a lot of volcanoes here, which are of interest. Okay, so we have to build a house here in the in the eighties for the director of an institution or national institutions that that lived in this place. So it was a a challenge to design a house in a place where you don't have uh, electricity, you don't have gas, uh, you don't have roads, you have very windy conditions and very cold in in summer and in winter okay some of the of the char characteristics of these climates are uh, the extreme weather windy very cold with uh, maybe 30 degrees of thermal amplitudes like in the deserts in the deserts okay 
uh, you can have, for example, minus 15 or minus 20 degrees under zero in the morning and maybe 15 or 20 degrees in the midday. So the thermal amplitude is very high and the material has to support uh, uh, to and tolerate these uh, high thermal amplitudes. Um, as I told you, it is very, very dry. So the, the humidity is very low, maybe 10, 15 to 20 percent all around the year. There is no energy supply. You don't have qualified workforce to build the buildings. So it is a main drawback. Uh, it is not possible to build during the winter because of the, the, the cold and the materials must uh, resist these extreme conditions. Uh, also, we have a uh, high daylighting and UV levels, uh, ultraviolet radiation levels. And the problem with the water, because it is in a volcanic zone that, is, uh, that has as arsenic, which is poisonous for people. Uh, and the good thing is that we have high solar radiation levels. So it is a, a condition that we can um, use to heat the buildings we do here, okay? This is a, a picture uh, of the solar radiation levels around the world. Here you have the zone of Puna. As you can see, it is one of the most uh, sunny regions in the world, okay? So um, we can use this energy in our bioclimatic uh, designs of buildings. Uh, which are the methods and the tools we use to design buildings in places like this? First of all, we have qualitative uh, tools like um, uh, to study uh, the climate and determine uh, which are the main strategies that we can use. For example, in this in, in Puna, um, we have to use the solar radiation as solar gains through glassings. We have to heat uh, to storage this heat in the thermal mass of the building, and we have to minimize the heat losses in the envelope of the building. Okay, some important uh, thing about uh, the the comfort zone shown here in in green. This is the comfort the adaptive comfort zone of Ashrae 55, which is a, a, a usually a used a definition for the comfort zone. But in Pune, we know about the uh, from the experience that this zone is a uh, much to the to the left okay um, people feel feel comfortable at maybe 18 or 17 degrees this is a good uh, comfort condition for them so we have to consider this when we design the we design the buildings okay um, the second uh, tools that we use are uh, for of course uh, measurements, in situ measurements, and simulations of the thermal behavior of buildings. The first building uh, I will show you is a building of the 80s. So the computer tools were not so common or, or so usual as today. They were uh, made in, in a program which is a uh, uh, like this, but in DOS previous versions, and they were calculated in the old um, computers of the university uh, in in the in the computer center of the university, which was a, a very big place with very big computers. Um, okay, and uh, in this place, we designed a, a building like this. Um, all the part that you see here with glass faces the north because we want to cut, cut uh, capture the solar radiation in winter in this part okay so you see here um, an, a, a glassed part which has trombe walls I, I will explain you a little bit later and you have a part that has a greenhouse here towards the north and towards the east to catch the solar energy here and to trespass this solar energy into the uh, indoor of the of this house. This is a house for a family, uh, for the director of this institution, which is here. Um, and um, 
the house has a 270 square meters and the design considered considered uh, that the spaces the indoor spaces needed to be very connected between them because you can uh, cannot uh, have uh, temperature differences between the spaces so it was very interconnected with with partitions that don't uh, reach the the, the roof uh, level in the top so the air can move from one space to the other okay here you can see also that behind the glass you have small windows that are placed for day lighting but the other part is made with a stone of the of, of this song okay uh, here uh, there is an other picture this is a trombe wall or trombe mitchell wall uh, which ha which is made of a um, very special stone in the zone that has a uh, high thermal conductivity and it provides high thermal mass so the sun uh, uh, tra traspasses the the build the layer of glass and it reaches the stone the stone is painted with a, a dark color like this it was a, a black painted of black and uh, it heats up so uh, the in in this part is the interior of the of the building the the cold air goes from these openings in the bottom it heats up and it flows through the top of the of the of this in these openings okay so it is a trombe wall which is the benefit the benefit is that you can store the heat the solar radiation that uh, is uh, is stored here in the wall and it is uh, uh, passed to the indoor air a few hours later so when the sun is down you still have here uh, enough heat to pass to the indoor uh, environment okay of course all these windows are of double glass but uh, made by by the workers because in those times uh, the industrial double glassing was not uh, were not available in in, in argentina of, uh, we have a, a very insulated roof with high, high thermal insulation. The construction is anti-seismic and the walls were made double, a, a double sandwich of stone with thermal insulation in the middle, okay? So, uh, sorry, um, this, uh, we have measurements of this building, but uh, we talked with the director of the people that lived here and they told us that in winters they don't need it to turn off the heating the conventional heating with with wood that they have here they never needed to turn off the the heaters here so this uh, design was really good for this uh, for this extreme climate we have a second um, example in puna which is a hospital here in in the bottom you can see the the biggest building in this uh, small uh, town which is called susques and this is the hospital of susques uh, you should imagine that the this is for for kids and for uh, for mothers uh, usually families walk a lot of hours six seven hours to reach this hospital so it is very important for for this zone okay in this uh, city we have electricity but the conditions are also very extreme so the design also included a trombe wall uh, in the north face of the hospital here it is combined with solar direct solar heat gains through windows, okay, and the trombe is here where, where you can see the stones painted with brown. And here we had uh, the possibility to install uh, industrial double glassing, okay. So it is the north part, of course, all the building is well insulated, and because it is not enough uh, 
to use these trombe walls and this direct solar gain to heat the entire building. We also use these uh, solar air collectors that are placed in the west part to heat the air inside the, the, the rooms of the hospital. Uh, these collectors were handmade in, in, in ENCO and installed by uh, the researchers of, of our institute. This design was made by, uh, by my colleague, Dr. Alejandro Hernandez. He took these pictures during the construction, the construction where you can see the thermal insulation and the stone here covering the insulation. So these two are two examples of uh, buildings that must suffer these extreme conditions and how it is possible to uh, use the solar energy to heat the indoors of these buildings. Here you have a picture of the trombe wall and uh, some calculations we made uh, previously to the previous to the to the design. We simulated it with the uh, two softwares uh, with Simediv and with Energy Plus, which are the tools that usually uh, we we use for for designs of bioclimatic building, buildings okay and the second part of my presentation uh, deals with uh, how the climate change influences the energy consumption of buildings you know that uh, in the world we have a, a global warming uh, due to the climate change and the emissions of greenhouse gases this is an animation of how our world is heating uh, in this century, in this 21st century. And as you can see here in the south of America, um, the north part of our country uh, is consistent, consistently being heated. And of course, also the south part of Argentina where we have glaciers and, and snow that are melting today, each day more and more. So it is a very complicated situation for, for our country and also for the world. Uh, and the buildings play a key role in uh, this climate change because you know they uh, uh, provoke uh, greenhouse emissions that contributes to this uh, global warming. In Argentina, the, the climate models um, predict that at the end of the 21st century, we will have a very big problems of heat in the north part, uh, including the province of Salta, which is here. Um, and uh, the prediction is something like uh, 2.5 to 5.5 degrees of uh, increment in the annual mean temperature. It is a, a lot, a, a lot for the climate and a lot for, of, for buildings too. Here in Patagonia, which is uh, here in the Andes, which, where we have the glaciers, um, is a, a very problematic zone too for the, for the global warming. Okay, so uh, we thought that um, buildings should cope or should be adapted to these uh, changing conditions in the future. Uh, just, just to show you what uh, the predictions are for Europe, uh, here you have uh, the projected changes in the annual mean temperature for Europe, and the dark, the, the darker zones are the most affected ones, which are the uh, the zones that are in the north part. But of course, also uh, all Europe, Spain, Italy, Greece. Uh, will have a lot of problems uh, because of uh, heat waves and high uh, temperatures all the year. Okay, so um, what will happen with the energy consumption of buildings? A, a short literature review shows us that uh, in, in the North Hemisphere, uh, the tendency is uh, that the energy demand for heating uh, will decrease in different uh, values depending on the country. For example, in Greece by about 90%, uh, in London 35 to 45%, okay, in Germany something be between 45 and 
and the cooling uh, energy uh, will uh, increase because of the higher temperatures and of course it depends also on the place for example in greece as much as 248 percent until the uh, 2100 for a scenario a2 which is a scenario um we uh, we usually use in building simulations okay so the tendency is that the cooling load load will increase and the heating load uh, will decrease uh, this can uh, be very problematic for the um, the grid of electricity because you will have during the cooling se uh, season uh, greater pressures uh, because of the increased consumption in the in the grid so these kind of things must be considered in the future um, in argentina uh, i want to show you our study we took uh, four places in different parts one in the north uh, one in the center in patagonia or in the center of the city and the other near the andes okay we took five cities uh, which has a considerable population and we studied what will happen uh, with the energy consumption and with the bioclimatic design of the houses in these places i will show you only one part of our research which is the changes in energy consumption uh, this uh, information is uh, published in this journal energy and buildings uh, and i can give you the the article if you and if you are interested in reading it so we took a, resi a residential house a family house a social house in particular of this uh, a plan with this plan is a it is a house with two bedrooms a kitchen and, and a living room it is small and we use this uh, typology because it is very usual here in argentina uh, it is a typology usual uh, the most common of social houses in argentina and because we monitored this house during several years so you, uh, we know exactly how it works how, how much it consumes and how are the indoor temperatures in this house so we can validate our simulation models with monitored results of this house and we have the conf uh, 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 and enough confident results of the simulations okay this house was simulated in these four places uh, the methodology is uh, of course uh, to have a, a information about the plants the materials the occupation schedules etc uh, the climate of the place and then we make um, a model a physical a thermal physical model we used energy plus as the tool engine to simulate the house and then we obtained the results okay the house was simulated in the four places for the present uh, weather and for future weather and uh, to talk about future weather we have to talk about climate models okay a global climate model is a mathematical representation of the climate of the earth uh, you have uh, here different components of the of the climate of the earth the atmosphere the land the ocean the sea uh, ice etc and all these components are uh, gridded in uh, and simulated uh, in in heat uh, using heat balances in each node okay so it allows us to predict what will happen with the climate in the future um, there is um, a lot of effort uh, in this in these simulations there are a lot of uh, institution institutions that participates that participate during these simulations and uh, the most important uh, are the is the project the couple model intercomparison project which is an international effort to improve these climate models and uh, currently we are using uh, the results of uh, the cmip5 okay 
uh, in this year, 2021, we will have the results of the CMIP-6. In this uh, work, we uh, used the results of the previous uh, results, which are available for everyone that wants to, to download it from the internet. Um, of course, during the years, yeah, the, the climate models and the grids were refined. So uh, it started with grids of something like uh, 500 kilometers. And along the years, it was uh, so small as uh, 25 kilometers, which are called regional models. And for Europe, uh, 20, uh, sorry, I think that it is uh, 10 or 12. 0.5 kilometers. So we have a very refined grid with a lot of information to work with. Uh, these climate models uh, gives you uh, monthly values or daily values of temperature, pressure, uh, relative humidity. But in buildings, we need um, a temporal uh, time of hours to simulate our building. So we have to um, morph uh, this morphing is the 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 methodology used or the method used to transform these uh, monthly values into hourly values okay and how it is do it is done um, because you have two uh, transformations one is the shift of the curve here you can see something like a, a temperature for example for example evolution and it, it can be shift a, a certain value that uh, could be, for example, the, the mean, the monthly mean temperature in the present and in the future, you can shift this quantity. And you can scale uh, by changing the amplitude of, uh, the, uh, of this wave, of this thermal wave, okay? So you can do a combination of these two methods and then you can obtain a, a prediction of how the uh, future climate will change with respect to the present day. So you have to use, a, for example, a, 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 a typical meteorological year to uh, transform it through the morphing methodology and obtain hourly values for the future that are shifted and scaled uh, and follows a, a similar pattern to the present time but it can allows you to simulate what will happen with your building in the future. Okay, we did this, this procedure for the four uh, cities I have mentioned, which are uh, the, the main results. For example, here we have the temperature differences of the air temperature uh, between present day and uh, 2080, okay, for the four cities. As you can see, the average temperature will change with something between 2.5 and 6 degrees in the future. It depends on the city. This city here in, in yellow is the city in the north part of the country, which suf will suffer the, the, higher, the highest uh, changes. And it also depends on the month of the year. Uh, in, in summer and autumn, the the temperatures will change more. Uh, so, sorry. If we go to the uh, um, to the values of the change, here you have, for example, the heating energy you, the, 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 that the house needs uh, in winter for the four cities. Okay, it is different because of the differences in climates, and here is the um, changes in. 20 and 80. As you can see, there uh, will be a decrease in the heat in the heating energy of, of something about 6.2, 6.0, 7.5, and 7.6 kilowatts hour per square meter per decade. And if you analyze the cooling the cooling energy, you will see that it will increase in the future with uh, the highest uh, increases in the city which is in the north part of the country okay if you consider both the heating energy in winter and the cooling energy in summer 
um, the annual energy consumption um, here will uh, decrease in general in uh, the different cities. We can show the same results in, in these graphs where you can see how the energy for air cooling will uh, increase as the monthly mean maximum mean temperature increase. So here in, in this box, you have the present day and in the in this part, you, you have the 20 and 80 years. And this is the line that the house will follow uh, in this century, okay, of, of the increase in energy for air cooling. And here uh, it is the, the slope and the line that is followed by the energy consumption for heating. Here we have the present day, and uh, because the minimum energy in winter will increase, you will have an, a decrease in the energy consumption for heating in the future, okay? These values are, are in line with uh, the values found by other researchers in other countries of the world. Um, and finally, we have here the annual tendency of the energy consumption in the different cities. Maybe in Poland you can find uh, uh, results that are similar to this one, that, this, uh, the, that the annual energy consumption will decrease because uh, the winters will be more uh, warm uh, and that the cooling energy will increase, okay? Uh, here, the only city that uh, presents um, a more uh, different result is, the, is here, uh, the city of Oran in the north of Argentina, where we find that the, in the future, the, in the 2080s, the tendency is to uh, increase the annual energy consumption. Okay, in the other cities of our country, because it is are uh, uh, dominated by by winter conditions or by cold conditions, the normal tendency is to down. So the main conclusions uh, that the air temperature in Argentina will increase in the future, both in winter and in summer. Um, something between 2.2 and 3.8 in the annual mean temperature, okay? The cooling loads will increase from 3.6 to 7.9 times in the future, and that the heating loads will decrease something between 23 and 59%. Uh, about the total annual energy, uh, it will decrease, except in, in Oran, in the city in the north, uh, and we also calculated the, the quantity or the value to have a, a, a measure of how much energy will, uh, we will predict in, in, the, in the different months. Uh, and it is in summer an increase of about 2.2 kilowatt meters per square meter per month for each degree of increment in the monthly mean outdoor temperature. And in winter, the value of, is of 3.00 per month for each degree of increment in minimum outdoor temperature. So the key points of, of this um, presentation is that the demand for heating would decrease, the cooling would increase, and um, we will have a greater pressure for the future grid, and that the impact of climate change must be studied at the local level, as you see here, the result, results are different depending of, of the, on the location we, when, where we are doing the calculations. And it is the same in all countries. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, you have also a spread of results uh, that depends on the, on the climate and the weather. So uh, the climate change must, must be studied at local level. And of course, adaptation and mitigation strategies must be adapted to this weather and uh, to the type of building we are work working with. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to make some questions, uh, I, I'll be glad to answer you.